Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their story, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today, we have Mark Kinnick with us. For 40 years, Mark has been and is an executive consultant and coach who focuses on executive leadership development strategy implementation, and organizational effectiveness for global consulting firms and small to large international organizations. Mark focuses on accelerating senior leadership team performance, improving customer focus, shareholder value, and employee performance challenges faced by organizations. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jamil. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to have you, man. How are you doing today? Excellent. Ah, so good. Yeah, for for it's probably about, about to say for those who don't know, but nobody knows what I'm about to say. So, so Mark and I met recently on the Big Island of Hawaii. We were there for a conference and such an amazing experience. I don't know about Mark, but it was my first time on the island. And right from when I first saw Mark, I got to meet Mark and his one, <clears throat> excuse me, his wonderful wife. And Mark just has a very calm, grounded presence and energy to him that I was immediately drawn to. And we just had such great conversations and knew I wanted to continue to get to know you and so happy to have you here on the show. Uh, Well, thank you again, Jamil. And yeah, it was my first time on the island also. Uh, Fantastic time. And and I was also drawn to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can be as specific. Uh, It was just more the energy and, and, uh, and really enjoyed our conversations there. I'm glad we get to continue them here. Absolutely. And so for my listeners who don't know you, Mark, and they haven't heard your story, I've often found successful people, they have a hero story. They have challenges, adversities they've overcome to get to where they are now. And if you'd please share with us your journey, your hero story. Well, sure, sure. And, and I'll try to hit some high points or low points, that however you want to bring <laughs> them up. But uh, as a kid, I was uh, one of the shortest, skinniest kids in the world. As a sophomore in high school, I was 5'2". And, and I, I, just as a, as a tangent here, I think of my life as a series of restarts. And we can call those transformations if you want. I sort of think of them as just a theory, series of restarts. And, and as that little skinny short kid, I, I wanted to succeed. I always had an incredible drive inside of me. And I ended up lettering in three sports mm-hmm. uh, through just sheer, sheer will and effort. Um, I graduated in college in information systems. I was extremely shy and introverted. So it led me sort of down into the computers where I could work on my own and not talk to anybody. But after college, I realized I really wanted to work with people and I I sort of restarted again. Um, That actually led me to to some of the things that that allowed you and I to meet. Uh, Learned with uh, Bandler and Grinder, the founders of Neuro Linguistic Programming, which sort of how uh, and in in a roundabout way ended up in in Hawaii together some 40 years later Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I I uh, left the global firm and as a programmer analyst to start working with people uh, cut my income at the time by at least two-thirds but it was a path I wanted to take and and it was exciting and um, grew a small consulting firm Two of us uh, ended up working with clients like Honeywell, IBM, AT&T, eventually going to work with one of my clients, Honeywell, uh, and and worked with them, left them to join a regional consulting firm running it, uh, did it well enough that that it got acquired. I got laid off and I had to restart again. I joined a a global consulting firm Um, Worked with them for a long period of time, actually the longest uh, employment of my career, 14 plus years. Um, 
And then six months after recovering from cancer, they decided they had, didn't have a need for me anymore. And I had to restart again. That was in my early 60s. Uh, and that sort of is in my current path now of running my own company. And, um, and, and sort of like every restart was, was, an, was either an opportunity to rely on past experience and knowledge to succeed or an opportunity to imagine and learn something different and succeed at a different level. And every time I sort of pick that, that second option of saying, oh, okay, I've got some knowledge and experience, but what don't I have? Mm. And, and, and really questioning what it was I didn't have that could make a difference if I did have it. And I've continued, continued to do that over and over again. So I guess in, in highlights, that's sort of my, my big journey. Yeah, something that you shared right in the beginning that I love that I think so many people can benefit from hearing again is this idea or the concept of a restart and this idea that you continue to re reinvent yourself over the years. And so like, you know, clearly you, you're no longer 5'2". <laughs> I'm six feet. When I met you, you are well bigger than, than I am. <laughs> and, I grew a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so... You know, when you were younger, you saw yourself in a certain light, you behaved in a certain way, and then life was going in a certain way for you as a result of those things. And when you realize either, you know, this isn't going to work anymore, I don't want to be this version of me anymore, I want to change, you reinvented yourself. And I think so often we are led to believe that who we are is some static thing, that I am this way, so I'm going to keep being this way. And then it keeps us trapped in that like self fulfilling prophecy, it keeps us stuck in that. And so just first kudos to you for embracing the, one of the things I often tell people, you know, who, who am I, who are you? And one of the things that is an answer of that is I am this moment. I am pure possibility. And from that perspective, I am not everything up until this moment because everything up until this moment isn't happening anymore. That's the past. This present moment, I'm, I'm brand new if I choose to, I am brand new, but I can choose to see myself brand new or I can choose to see myself in an old light and that creates how I live my life going forward. Any comments on that for the people who are seeing that you've reinvented yourself several times and then maybe they can too. So, so yeah, so looking at our past experiences and knowledge and insights and beliefs and all that is an incredible source of strength. Mm -hmm. And it's also a trap. Yeah. And, and in being able to look at it in both lights as we're trying to take that next step, whether we're going through some giant restart or just our next day of life. And you know, I, I do a lot of work with leadership teams and that's the constant challenge is, is there's this incredible fear about letting go of what got, what got us here. And, and you know, uh, Malcolm uh, Gladwell's book, uh, What Got Us Here Won't Get Us There. Um, and, and it's like, we've got to take that into heart. Uh, what got us here won't get us there. And even if we like where we are today, that, that cuts us off of a possibility that's so much richer tomorrow. Mm. And, and being able to live in that space, and, and for me as a coach and consultant, and I imagine for you also, Jamil, being able to effectively invite people into that space in a way that they can start to comfortably be there more often even if we all can't live there, I certainly don't live there all the time, but be there more often. And, and uh, you know, I sort of have to give kudos to my, my parents. So, you know, we all learn some things from our parents. We're a product of our parents. There's gifts they give us and, and there's limitations they give us. But one of the gifts that, that my parents gave me was uh, an insatiable curiosity and a willingness to be different. Mm. Um, where we grew up, um, my, my, I'm half Sicilian. My dad was 100% Sicilian. And we grew up eating different foods, uh, thinking different thoughts than our neighbors. And it was very obvious to me. And from my friends, it was very obvious to me. And it wasn't different is better, different is worse. It was, wow, this is interesting. And, and I'd like to share a story from my dad, I guess. Please. One of the things my dad would do when he came home from work every night, you know, I'm growing up in the 50s, so this is a while ago, okay, in different <laughs> culture and environment and all that. <laughs> but we'd wait for dinner, 
until my dad came home and we'd then sit down together as a family. My dad would do two things. First, he'd tell us a joke or some humorous story, age appropriate. I'm talking about when I was eight, my brother was six, my sister was 10, okay? And he'd tell us an age appropriate joke that we could laugh at. And then he'd share something that either he read that day or experienced. And he'd ask us, and it was sort of in a frame of a problem. And he'd say, so what would you guys do with that? And we, we were expected to express our opinion and our point of view and take a stand. And our point of view and our stand was never wrong. It was always interesting to him. And he explored it. And I grew up with that. And it framed a lot of how I approach life. I love that your dad did that. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that <laughs> when I have kids. Like, <laughs> that, that, that's so great. And it also, it's wonderful because it encourages you to speak your truth. It encourages you to, like you said, take a stand, have an opinion, and to be heard. So mm -hmm. often, I think so many of us we have this underlying frustration. You know, some people that I've worked with, people that I met over the years, there's almost this underlying frustration that what I believe and what I think doesn't really matter, so they don't express it but that unspoken truth is still there. And yeah. so they, whether it's in a relationship, intimate relationship, whether it's family, colleagues, clients, whatever it is, not expressing that truth is always often detrimental. And so to have that at such a young age kind of built into you, that's wonderful. And, and there's the flip side of that, remember. There's the, my sister, my brother, and my dad, and my mom had their point of views also, and they weren't wrong. Yeah. It was, I got to take my stand and my truth and my way of looking at the world. And I also was expected to hear, honor, and respect theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something to that point for everyone listening, because Mark brings up a really good point. When it comes to truth, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing, right? Because we, we each have what we experience as truth. Some, like the way Mark put it, my truth, right? We might, uh, my truth, your truth, right? And when we think of it as everyone experiences life in a certain way, you've got everything coming into your senses, you've got your beliefs about yourself, about other people, about the world, and think of it like a filter. And all of this life experience is getting processed through that filter and then it, <clears throat> excuse me, it goes into you and now you create this story, this meaning. And to you, that's life, that's, this is how it works. But in reality, it's really just your perspective because somebody else with different beliefs and different filters has a whole different experience. And for them, that's true for them. Yes. So like you said, it's wonderful to say, you know, I'm going to take my stance. This is my perspective. This is my truth. But dad had a different truth. My sister had a different truth. The neighbor has a different truth. And when we can take that step away and say, well, what if my way isn't necessarily the way? My way is a way. And what if, you know, this is just my perspective, this is how I see the world, how do you see things? And when we can take that step away from just, I'm right, and you know, it's my way or the highway kind of thing, and we can step into more, everyone else is probably, not even probably, they're definitely seeing something I'm not seeing, and they have some perspective that I don't have right now, and I might have a piece of the puzzle, and other people's perspectives gives me a grander picture of it. Yes, and together we can enrich each other's lives. Absolutely. Something that you said earlier, you, you, you talked about the book, um, is uh, what got you here won't get you there, right? And so this idea, we talked about reinventing yourself. And so when you, I'd like everyone who's listening, think about your life and think about there are th certain things in your life right now. There are certain people in your life right now. And there's certain ways of being, there's certain ways that you express yourself that don't serve you anymore. There are certain things that they did serve you in the past. And that's kind of the reason why we hang on to it because we think that, well, this really helped me before and, in, and I kind of like where I'm at right now. And if I let that go, am I gonna lose this great stuff I have right now? And so that living from that fearful place, it keeps us in patterns that don't serve us. It keeps people around us that don't belong there anymore and keeps things in our life that also don't belong there anymore. And so being willing to say, you know, let me let go because where I wanna be, I need some new input to create the new output. But if I'm going to keep the same input, the future is not going to be any different. Yes. Yeah. And, and if I can jump off from that, Jamil. Please. It's like um, there's a, a, something I learned a long time ago about success patterns. Okay. And one of the success patterns that very, very few people 
engage in is called wind shift. In other words, most of us, it's like lose or we're challenged or there's tension or there's conflict. And so we have to shift. We don't shift when we win, okay? And, and uh, I, I, I'm gonna use an example that I, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people are not gonna relate to, but there was a company <laughs> called DEC, D-E-C. And back in the day, this is back in the uh, 70s, okay? And 80s, and they were the world's largest computer company. World's largest. And you probably haven't heard of them, no. okay? They built mini computers. And this thing called this personal computer came around that IBM was making and um, Apple had their version of it back then. And they looked at it and said, oh, this is a fad. It'll never catch on. Mm. They no longer exist today. They're gone. You know, and, and but they were the world's largest. And it's like when we're winning, we get comfortable. Mm. And, and if we're willing, and so it, just even small things, we have our favorite restaurant. We have our favorite way, our, our favorite walk after dinner. We go the same path every time. We, what are the ways that are working for us? What are the very little small things that are working for us? What would happen if we shifted? What if happens if we go to a, a different restaurant tonight or this week, weekend? What happens in our walk uh, for today? We go a different path. What would we notice? What would stimulate our thought process? What would engage us in seeing the world in a different way today? So just some thoughts on that. When uh, no, I love that. And it also brings to mind a story that I heard about, this is in the, I think early 2000s, but it could be, you know, give or take a couple of years. Uh, Blockbuster had the opportunity <laughs> to buy Netflix. Yes, yes. And, and my understanding is they said they turned it down I think it was like a hundred million or something like that, but they turned it down because their perspective was people will always want to come into the store to buy their movies. And granted, there are some people who really enjoy doing that, Yes, but they were not willing to be, let's say, open to a new possible future. They weren't adapting to the change yes. of times and the companies that saw the, the kind of a digital age, if you want to refer to it as that, they thrived. And my understanding is there's only one blockbuster store left. And I think it's in Washington. <laughs> and, <Okay. laughs> and regardless, it's like, if you're not willing to adapt, if you're not willing to change it up. And like you said, you know, most of us, we, if we're driving to work, we drive the same way. We eat the same kind of things. We kind of live the same day over and over again. And sometimes we start to get into a rut and we feel that life is boring. And I have said to clients in the past, with respect, life isn't boring. You're being boring. <laughs> yes. And when we can come from that headspace of saying, all right, is that true? Like, how am I being boring? And then like Mark just said, oh, wow, I've done pretty, I've lived essentially the same day over and over again for the last four years. Yeah. What could, and then when I said earlier, who, who am I? I am this moment. I am pure possibility. What that means is that if I realize, well, I'm being boring, well, what would I want to be instead? Well, I want to be adventurous. I want to be bold. I want to be fun. And I might yeah. say, okay. What's an adventure that you'd like to go on? Well, I'd like to do that. How do you feel about it? Well, excited and a little bit afraid. Cool. You want to do Good. it? Like, yeah. Good. And you step into it. And then all of a sudden that day is completely different because the input changed. So the output changes and everything, you know, your life can change in an instant, but you know, it's like life is always changing, but your felt experience of it will change when you change. Yes. Yeah. And you, you know, it's interesting when you look, what comes to my mind when you're saying that, Jamil, is like there's sort of transition points in our life. So at some point, because when we're kids, most of us, if we had some sort of healthy upbringing, okay, most of us um, leaned into learning without fear, with curiosity, with fun. It was like, oh, a new game. Oh, let's try it. Let's not do the old game. Let's do the new game. Wh whatever it was, it was like, okay, oh, tennis. Okay, let me try tennis. Oh, swimming, let me learn how to swim. We leaned into all that. And at some point in our lives, we went from all of a sudden, it's like maybe our brains got too full or something. It was like, oh, I know enough. Mm. I'm not sure if that was the conclusion, but it's sort of like, I have to start now relying on past knowledge and experience rather than potential knowledge and experiences. And I got to share my dad at 93, 
was still cutting out articles out of the Wall Street Journal, sending them to me and saying, Mark, let's talk about this. Mm. You know, it's sort of like, what's new? What is, what are we leaning into that's different today? I think a really powerful question. I often pose this to friends of mine, clients of mine, and to myself. <laughs> uh, uh, during COVID, especially during the lockdowns, I I caught myself in one of those ruts of kind of, you know, I, I'd worked from home, I worked out at home, I did everything at home. And it almost felt like I was living the same day over and over again. And just the question that I want everyone to reflect on is when is the last time I did something for the first time? Excellent, I love it. And when yeah. you can just sit with that question as and be as honest with yourself as possible, and you might realize it's been a while. And if that's the case, like today's the day and let's make a new decision. And it's amazing how quickly life can change. Mark, so, so again, we have something you want to share? But, but I, they're trying something new, something different. Um, one, of, one of the things, so many of us are perfectionists in life. I am, okay? I've tried to cure myself of that. I've been partially successful, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the people I've been working with, one of the coaches I use, uh, he said something to me, and I really try to, to have it in my mind a lot. And um, his name is Matt Clark. And he essentially said, Mark, I'd like to have your first shitty version. And it's like it changed the, the standard. Instead of, oh my gosh, I have to write something and I, it's got to be brilliant. No, he wants the first shitty version. Yeah. The rough like, draft. <laughs> yes, not even a rough draft. He wants it shitty. <laughs> <laughs> and it changed the standard. It changed the, the approach and the mentality of how I can lean into things and try something new. Yeah. Yeah. There was a talk that I gave um, to this gr group in Arizona years ago. And one of the things I said, it kind of goes with what you just said. So often we try something for the first time and we get discouraged when it doesn't go well. But the thing is that at least in my mind, if you're doing something for the first time, you should almost expect that it's not going to go well. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and when you expect you're not going to be brilliant at it the first time you do it, then you can just have fun with it because there's no pressure. You're just going to do it. But when you put all the pressure on yourself that it's got to be perfect, it's like, you know, let's say, for example, if you want to be an author and you want to write a book. Well, if you're trying to edit it at the same time you're trying to write it, and you're trying to be perfectionist about it and the chapter has got to be the best you could possibly do. You're never going to get past chapter one, but exactly. if you just write the book and you allow yourself to just, I forgot who said it. Um, it was one of those, you know, old school philosopher authors, but he said, basically writing is the easiest thing in the world. You just sit down grab a pen and bleed. <laughs> yeah. That you just kind of let go. Like you let out rather yes. in you, yes. you, know, you just put it in there on paper, edit it after perfect, perfect it after but it's always a work in progress. You know, it, it reminds me of the story that I heard. This guy um, works for this company and the, the boss says, hey, I want you to put this report on my desk by like this time. And so the guy shows up and he puts the report down and the boss doesn't read it. And he calls him back into the office a couple hours later. And the guy's thinking, did I do something wrong? Like what happened? And he thinks the boss read it. And so the boss takes his, his report and he looks at him and he goes, hey, you know, Jack, just question for you. Is this the best you can do? And Jack is thinking, oh, wow, I really messed up. Like he must have thought I'm so bad. <laughs> and Jack goes, oh, well, no, no, I, I could do better. And he goes, all right, great. So take it back, do better, and then bring it back to me. Next day, same thing. And he gives it to him, calls him back a couple hours later. Jack, you know, is this the best you can do? And Jack's thinking, well, I thought I, I thought so, but I guess I could do better. And he takes it back. That happens two or three more times. Eventually, on the last time, the boss goes, Jack, is this the best you can do? And he goes, like, whatever his boss's name is, you know, Derek, I don't know how I could make this possibly any better. And he goes, great, I'll read it now. <laughs> but it's a work in progress. Like, it doesn't have to be perfect in the beginning. But did you put in the effort? Are you proud of it? Like, are you actually showing up to the best you can, you know? Yes. Something that I wanted to circle back to, you, you mentioned NLP earlier. You and I share a background in neuro-linguistic programming. For those who maybe never heard of it, how, what is NLP to you? What is that? Oh, great. <laughs> uh, 
so let me, if I can answer that in two different ways, Jamil. Yeah, however you'd like. So, so remember I, I mentioned in college, I graduated with an information degree, computer science programming. Mm. Okay. So, so from that perspective, neuro-linguistic programming is literally a programming language, but on how we construct our reality and interact with the world. Mm. It's understanding the programming language on how our brains and to a certain extent our bodies work to either be unsuccessful or wildly successful or somewhere in between because we're running programs and subroutines that either work or don't work just like computer programs that either work or don't work mm. so that's one way of, of looking at it okay mm -hmm. um another another way of looking at it is it is um the metaphors and beliefs that we operate on our life with. And if we change the metaphors or change the beliefs, we will get radically different results. Yeah. And so that's back to, if I can use the, the previous example of going to work every day the same way. Okay. That's a metaphor for your life. If you go to work a different way every day, that becomes a metaphor for your life. If you go to the exact same restaurant every weekend, that's a metaphor for your life. Mm -hmm. If you go to a different restaurant every weekend, that becomes a metaphor for your life. So what are the metaphors we are constructing around us that start to impact us at deeper levels that we can't even fathom and if we change the outside, we can actually change the inside. So anyways, two different ways of thinking about it. No, very, very well said. It reminds me of the old expression, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so like the person who has, let's say, the, the really messy bedroom and the filthy car, their office desk at work is probably not pristine. You know, and it's a way of being. It's like, like the way your car is, that's a metaphor for your life. Like the same kind of idea. And for those listening, another way of, um, I think simply thinking of NLP, anyone who is performing at a, a level that you look at and you say, wow, that's amazing. Well, let's say an athlete, a performer in any respect, business, whatever area of life, there's certain things that that person is thinking about. There's certain actions that they take and think of it almost like a strategy. There's a certain yeah. way that that person is in relationship to life. And that's why they create to a large degree the results that they do. And the perspective might be, well, if I adopted some of those behaviors, if I, if I saw that in the same way they did, if I acted in that same way, I'd probably create a similar result. And in NLP, they call that modeling. And so yeah. if we come from that headspace, it's amazing what we can replicate. And I think a really empowering belief that serves people, if someone else out there has done it, then you can too. Now, obviously we all have different levels of ability. We're all born into different situations, all that kind of stuff. And there's some practical constraints every now and then, but in general, if you were to adopt the belief, if someone else can do it, I can do it too. I know um, there's that famous story that a lot of people have probably heard of, of Ro uh, Roger Bannister. And he was the first person who broke the four minute mile. And before he did that, I think, uh, don't quote me on it, but I think he's like 403, 401, 402. He's somewhere in that range. He's close. And, well, and there were doctors who said it was physically yeah. impossible for human beings. Yep. Yeah. People cannot run that. And so my understanding is he got to a point where he realized I can't train any harder physically. Like I'm doing everything. So what he started to do was he trained in his mind. And he visualized himself running in, you know, 359 or 358 or whatever he was seeing, but it was sub four. And yeah. he was seeing it over and over and over again. He was imagining the run over and over again. And then one day he went out there and he breaks four minutes. But notice that, like Mark said, up until that point, it was considered physically impossible. So when you think it's physically impossible, you will hold yourself back and you will stop prematurely when you could potentially keep going because you're, it's starting to get difficult. And at that point, really, like the fastest mile I've ever run was back in the day. It was like a 445. I can't imagine running a 401 or something. <laughs> so running a 401, 402 is already in, in amazingly intense. Yeah. To think that, all right, well, humans can't break four. So I must be like, I'm like, oh, that's the best. But here's this guy thinking, no, no, I can do better than that. 
And he believed it, saw it in his mind, did it. But once he did that, my understanding is over the next year, 30 something people yes. broke the four exactly. mile. Exactly. Because now other people see it's possible. Other people just allowed in a whole new reality, a whole new belief that, well, if this guy can do it, it's not impossible anymore. Maybe I could do it. Yes. How, how did you do it? They shifted how they saw it. They shifted how they trained. And that's also almost like a metaphor for NLP. And if we can yes. come from that headspace, you see someone else doing something. It's almost like one of the books that I read years ago. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by a guy named Robert Kiyosaki. Yes. And he's a big real estate guy. And he has in there that when he was a kid, his quote unquote rich dad, because he had, uh, you know, uh, like his friend's dad was his rich dad and his biological dad was his kind of poor dad in terms of their mentality. And his poor dad would always say, I can't afford it. And his rich dad would say, how can I afford it? And just that question shifted the whole experience. In that same way, if you think the four minute mile or whatever your equivalent of that is impossible, oh, I can't do that. I can't afford it, right? But if it's like, well, no, 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 no. Roger did it. How can I do it? Yes. That's a whole different question that brings up resourcefulness that maybe you didn't even know was there. And then you get to where you're going. And so, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> so, so for just to re relate a personal story on that, uh, when I was uh, going from computer programming to being a coach and a consultant, I had public speaking engagements to give. Mm. And I was the worst public speaker ever on the planet. I not only was it agonizing for me, I think people in the audience started dying. It was so bad. <laughs> and, and, but I knew that people did this. They stood in front of people and they talked and they were engaging and, and powerful and impactful and people learned and they wanted to come back and all this. That wasn't me, but I knew that I could be that. I knew that that was a possibility, and I did amazing. I did incredible things. I I took uh, voice lessons to find out how to speak from my core instead of my throat. Okay, I took mime lessons to learn how to use my hands and my body. I did modeling lessons to learn how to stand in front of groups. I did Toastmasters to learn how to speak, yeah. and I packaged all that together and and. I'm a different person in front of groups now. Yeah. Literally, if you said, hey, Mark, I have an opportunity for you. Do you want to speak in front of 500 people next week? I'd go, yes, I do. Yeah. And before it was like, oh my gosh, I'd be sweating. <laughs> Something that you said that I hope everyone takes to heart is before you did all of that, it was, wow, you know, there are people who speak and they come up there and they just do a great job. And that's not me. And notice that that's the story that so many of us run and run our pattern, our strategy, let's say. But the truth is, that's not me yet. Like yes. That's not me up until this point. But it's because in a way, I haven't chosen it to be me. And so notice all the stuff Mark did. Like, I don't even know how I would start finding mime lessons. Like, he, he was resourceful. <laughs> he went out there. And so the voice lessons, the Toastmasters, the mime lessons, all this stuff. And now he's a really great speaker. And there's people that are listening who are going to say, you know, I'd really love to do that. And then the question becomes, all right, great. So what are you doing about that? Yes. What lessons are you getting? What, how are you practicing? Like, how are you getting better? And if how you're do not break doing down, that, nothing's going to change. Yeah. How do we break it down instead of, I want to be that, but I'm not that instead of what are the 10 parts of that, that I could learn that would start moving me towards that. And how can I accelerate my way, which again, back to NLP, NLP is an accelerator. Um, it's a learning methodology that accelerates things so fast. Mm -hmm. I and love it. That's what you and, and that's what I provide to our clients so they can accelerate. Yes. And I love that you said, it's like, you know, it's almost like, what are the 10 steps, right? Somebody might say, like using Mark's example that he just gave, if someone said, hey, you want to go speak to a room of 500 people? He's like, absolutely, let's do it. They, if they said 5,000, 50,000, even better. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. But for somebody who's never spoken in front of a group, they might think, well, so you just expect me to go from zero to 100, zero to the 5,000 people? And it's like, no. If you broke it down into like the 10 steps, like metaphorically, it's like step one might be go to Toastmasters, speak in front of four people. It might exactly. be go to your kids and give a talk to them. 
It might be, you know, script something and just make a YouTube video and get a little bit comfortable day by day by day in front of a camera, a little bit comfortable speaking to your family in a certain way that you're not used to, mm -hmm. you know, join a local community event or something and contribute in some way, be a part of the uh, chamber of commerce, you know, something like that. There's all these ways to get exposure and experience, but bite-sized pieces. If you're just a little bit better, one of the things that I noticed was a trap that I fell into that so many people fell into and, and continue to fall into is this trap of comparison. This trap of, I look at where I'm at now and let's say it's, I've never yeah. spoken, let's say to a group and I'm terrified to think about it, but I kind of want to. And then I look at someone like you, let's say right now, who's so comfortable in front of a group and I compare myself to you now instead of you back then. And I say, it's like, I'm, comp I'm comparing my chapter one to your chapter 20. Yeah. And I'm saying, you know, I should be where Mark is right now. And it's like, no, I shouldn't because Mark's done all that work in the, in the 19 chapters that I haven't lived yet that's gotten him to where he is. And when we can embrace that, to me, it's not a comparison of you to somebody else. It's you to how you were yesterday, you to how you were a year from now. And I think that anyone who, like I said, life's always changing, we're always changing. But if we can really slow down and work on ourselves and improve day by day, a couple months, six months, a year, your whole life will feel different. You'll look back and say, I am not the same person I was last year. And that's a great thing. And it's a whole different experience of life as well. You know, and, and one of my favorite analogies that I share a lot, okay, I'll share it here, is that um, we didn't learn to walk by walking. Yeah. We learned to walk by falling down. And every time we fell down, we got a little bit better sense of balance. And not once did we look around and say, I guess I'm just a walker. I mean, I'm just a guess, I guess I'm just a crawler. They're the walkers. We never ever came to that conclusion. Yes. <laughs> when we have that certainty, that belief, I will figure this out. Yes. You know, it's amazing what changes. So something I wanted to ask you, Mark. So you've been through a lot, you've overcome a lot, you've achieved a lot. And on this kind of journey of your own personal transformation, how's that driven you to help others transform their lives, to help to be that transformational agent for them? So um, the good and the bad of it, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's part of how I live my life, okay? Um, even at the workshop we were at where everybody's learning this, I'm trying to help them e learn even faster, yeah. okay? I'm trying to push myself and push them, okay? I am always trying to accelerate into that next step. Um, I shouldn't say always. I tried to do that often, okay? Now, sometimes I overdo it. You know, uh, I have kids and, um, and brothers and sisters, and um, I want to help them get better and accelerate too. Um, and I have to hold myself back because they're not necessarily engaging with me for the purpose of transformation. OK, mm -hmm. uh, or restarting or that sort of thing. And and so I've got to really be in tune with that. Now, with my clients, they do hire me for that. And I am very straightforward with them. They respect me for that. They want me for that. Um, I give them extremely straight, blunt feedback. Uh, like you said earlier about you have a boring life. Well, maybe you are boring. <laughs> <laughs> You're being at least boring. <laughs> let's, let's take a look at that, okay? And, and, and we have that relationship at a deep level where that can happen, which again, our ability to look at and face reality face to face, rather than hide from our dark side, our shortcomings, all of that. And that translates to, to the relationship with the clients. If I'm hiding from my dark side, if I'm hiding from my shortcomings and have to seem like I've got it all together, well, I'm going to communicate that to you in some way that you better operate the same way. Mm. If I'm willing to be transparent about my dark side, if I'm willing to be transparent about my shortcomings and face them head on, I'm going to communicate that to you also and help you do the same. And I, I'm not, I'm not I, I, sorry, I went on a, on a roll. I lost the question. Not sure if I answered it. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. And something you just said that I, I hope the people who are listening really take to heart. 
you don't exist on an island of one. So there's a ripple effect that your being, how you show up in the world has. So let's say you have kids. If you're hiding that dark side, you're suppressing, you're not dealing with the stuff that probably should be dealt with to get to where you want to be, you're modeling that to them. So they see, okay, I guess this is how you handle things. I guess this is how we're supposed to do that. You have people around you, that's going to have an impact. So how, you know, how are you showing up? Yeah. And if we could shift, I, I'd love to ask you, Mark, you know, the foundation of my work is helping people create an extraordinary life without regret. And I'd love to ask you, what does an extraordinary life without regret look like for you? Um, well, it, it's being in the moment. It's being honest, transparent, vulnerable, authentic in the moment. Mm. It's being clear about my intentions, knowing that I will continually fall short like that kid learning how to walk like when I was learning how to walk I will continually fall short and that that's totally not okay expected and accepted and and that's what me is living an incredible life without regret is mm. and if I have any regrets that I learn from it the only requirement is that I learn and, and I was saying not repeat, that said, I will repeat and learn from the desire to not repeat, okay? Yeah. And, and, and so hold myself accountable to learning. Hmm. Hmm. I love that. I, I love the, you know, the embracing of, you know, one of the tenets of NLP for those listening is there, are, there is no failure, there's feedback. Yes. When we come from that space, you know, I win or I learn. Like I don't lose. It's yeah. like I win or I learn. I'm always creating a result. Is it the result that I want it? And if it's not, how did I create that? And, and how can I, you know, create something different? But always being willing to learn, to me, that's such a beautiful way to live because, and also you started by saying just really being in the present moment. When we're, when we're in that present moment, we're experiencing life fully. We're doing what we love. We're, we're enjoying it, but we stumble along the way. And like you said, it's expected. It's part of the journey. Like I remember, uh, there's a Michael Jordan quote. It's a, it's a fairly long one, but the end of it's basically, I have failed so many times and that's why I have succeeded. Yeah. Failure is how you get there. It's not the thing to avoid. <laughs> you know, we, we think about him as the best person to have the ball at the end of the game and he'll tell us how many times he missed the end of the game shot. Yeah. Yeah. But he is always the one wanting to take it. Yes. You know? And yeah, step up. That part is so beautiful that you just said. So he's missed the game winning shot, let's say X amount of times, and yet he's always willing to take it. And so notice that for so many of us, we get to a point where we've missed our, whatever our equivalent of the game winning shot is. Yeah. And that becomes the traumatic experience that we use as justification to not take the shot anymore. Yes. We hold ourselves back and we say, you know, I tried that once and it didn't go so well. And because of that, we play small. But what if we're willing to keep embracing it, keep saying, just because I missed it last time doesn't mean I'm going to miss it this time. See, and that comes back to what you said before, Jamil, about the comparison. Am I comparing myself to myself in a bad way or myself and somebody else in a bad way instead of intention around what is it I tend to do? And back to what you said about the feedback. Anything that's happening is feedback. It's actually helping me to get better. And I, say, I say this to businesses all the time. Um, my, my quote, um, it is not possible to be high performing without, without a feedback rich environment. Mm. Okay? And, and the absence of feedback, I mean, imagine, again, thinking of business, because I do a lot in business, imagine uh, tracking sales on a every six month basis. Well, we wouldn't have enough data to learn what were happening in sales. We could never be high performing in sales. And so we have to have a feedback rich environment and our intention frames what we want feedback around and we should be welcoming it with open arms because then it's helping us succeed on our intention in life. Dropping the comparison, grabbing the intention, inviting the feedback. Yeah, it reminds me of, there's a Babe Ruth quote, every strikeout brings me one step closer to my next home run. Yes. But notice that if you're the batter in this baseball metaphor and you come from the headspace that, well, 
This is my third at bat of the game. I struck out the first two. I really hope I don't strike out this time. And I'm walking up to the plate and I'm kind of nervous and I'm thinking, oh, wow, that pitcher's gotten me twice already. This might be the third time. I am so living into and putting all of my energy into striking out the thing that I don't want that I'm going to recreate that because now there I am in my batting stance and the ball's coming down, but I'm in my head thinking about striking out instead of being present to, oh, the pitcher did this. That tells me it's probably this kind of pitch. You know, I'm not present. So I'm going to react late. I'm going to miss the ball. I'm going to tip it and I'm going to strike out. Yes. But if I were to say, you know, the last two at bats, I struck out, but I learned from it. And I say, wow, you know, first he had the change up and then he had this. And I didn't know he threw that pitch, but now I've seen them all. And then I'm really present knowing the last two at bats have nothing to do with this one. That creates a freedom that creates a presence that allows you to get into that flow, get into that high performance state. But so often we hold ourselves back. Because we come yeah. from that fearful space of comparing ourselves to the past mistakes in quotes, and we don't learn from it, and we typically repeat them. And so, Mark, in service of that extraordinary life without regret, I'd love to know, if you, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what is, you know, one of the biggest changes or the biggest change, if it comes to mind, that you'd love to make in your own life over the next year? Oh, excellent question. I love it. Um, I, so... I am. I consider myself not that great at sales. Um, my I'm, my business is doing great because my clients love what I the value I deliver to them, so they ask me back a lot. I want to get new clients, and so the biggest change I want to make over the next year is really um, making it easier for people, CEOs out there, because that's my client base. CEOs, presidents of organizations, make it easier for them to find me and engage in me in an initial conversation. Mm. That's what I'm really working towards. Wonderful. And I hope also people notice, and this is what I, I love these kind of conversations because there's so much value to derive from what you're saying that sometimes is even missed. I want people to notice that as far, Mark's been doing this for 40 years. He's created immense success. He's helped all these organizations, all these people. And yet the biggest change he wants to make is he wants to get better at sales, which is something that somebody who's just starting might be struggling with thinking that, oh, one day I'll have it all figured out. <laughs> but like, it's a process and you just keep getting better at it. But there's always like the little challenge or the stumbling block. There's a way to improve. One of my favorite quotes is the master has mastered the art of being a student forever. Yes. The student thinks that there's a point where they arrive, where there's no more learning to be had, there's no more oh. to be done. There's a lot of people who they graduate school and they think whether it's high school, college, whatever, and they think, I don't have to read anymore. Like, and they put books away, I don't have to learn. Now, of course yes. you don't have to do anything, but the point of they're thinking that I've read all I need to read, I'm done. And then they wonder why they aren't really growing as much as they would like. It's a work in progress and you can keep getting better and better. And so, Mark, if you could go back in time and speak with your 18-year-old self, is there any advice that you'd have for him? Things that maybe he could start doing, stop doing, do differently, embrace more? Okay, so when, when I was growing up and, and 18 and all that, I was fearless in so many areas of my life, but I was not fearless in relationships. Mm -hmm. I would say, be fearless in your relationships, Mark. Mm. Be willing to experiment. Be willing to put yourself out there first. Be willing to engage. Uh, be willing to handle rejection a thousand times over and find out, look at that as feedback. And just, I would say, Mark, you know, remember I talked about being very shy and introverted. I would say, Mark, bring the fearlessness that you already have as a core part of who you are into relationships. Mm. And something that you just said that's great is think of it like a, for the people listening, it's like a transfer of skill. You mm. have a strength in one area of your life where in this case, you know, you're fearless in all these respects, but in a different area of your life, let's say you, you show up as fearful, mm -hmm. but it's the same skill that you have. You just aren't applying it to that area of your life because you got different stories. In yeah, the area stories of stories and beliefs and metaphors. And, yeah. yeah. Whatever the, so everyone is listening. If there's an area of your life, whether it be in your business or in your health, in the gym, in your relationship, whatever it is, there's an area that maybe you're just crushing it. You're doing so well. And think about 
how do I relate to this area? What stories do I tell myself? What are the metaphors, like Mark said? What do I believe about my ability in these areas? And so, for example, you might say, you know, I'm a champion in the gym. Like I work out all the time. I can, I, I'm excited to do new lifts. I'm excited to get challenged and not be able to do it and then grow through it. I, mean, I, I willingly accept feedback from maybe my, my, like my fitness coach or whatever. But maybe in your relationship or at work, you're unwilling to accept feedback and you're afraid to do this. And it's like the same skill set. Let's transfer it over by replicating whatever stories you've got in the area that's working. Let's yes. mold it into the area where it's not working as well. And things can change so, so quickly. Yes, accelerate. Yeah, exactly, accelerate, exactly. And so we just went into the past and I'd like to go into the future with you. And so if you met future Mark, he lives one year from today. He's just such an expert, expert at sales and everything else that you possibly would love to be amazing at. How would he advise you now? Oh, wow, okay. Um... How would he advise me now? He would say, May, Mark, don't take quick, don't take big steps, take small steps faster. I love that. Take small steps faster. That's really cool. It reminds me of that, um, you know, fail quickly, fail forward kind of idea. Yes, yes. Small steps faster, learn from it, and don't allow yourself to get discouraged and just keep going yeah. forward. Like that's beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So what would you say is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're extremely grateful for and why? Oh, I, that's easy, I guess. Um, when I was, uh, let's see, it must have been uh, 25 or so, um, I met a guy you might be interviewing on, on your program, Paul, Dr. Paul Sheely. And uh, he wasn't a doctor back then. And I wanted to go to work with him because he was in consulting and coaching. And I was in computer programming. And he said to me, you can work with me as long as you go to this thing called neuro-linguistic programming. I said, what the heck is that? And he described, and I still said, what the heck is that? <laughs> yeah. well, and I quit my job and I went to Santa Cruz for a month to learn this and embark on a whole different journey of my life. And um, that was a huge risk. And uh, the, the gains from that are, well, 40 years later, immense. Beautiful. I hope everyone listening, if, you, if there's an area in your life that you're not satisfied with, could be a big area, could be a small area relatively, but notice that you can completely shift like Mark did. You can reinvent yourself. You can be going south and you just 180 it and you start going north. Like there's no, there's nothing stopping you outside of the story that you tell yourself about why you can't do it. Yes. You know, we all have our justifications and our reasons. And one of my mentors is coming to mind right now. He had this line, excuses sound best to the person who's making them up. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we buy into it. We actually believe them. <laughs> yeah, we, we believe them, which is why like a big aspect probably of what Mark and I can agree on that we do is helping people question those stories that they've got. Yes. But, you know, regardless of your story, please know that it, it is possible for you and available to you to choose. If, you, if there's an area of your life that's not working the way you want it to, a big shift can be made. You, you are the author of your story. You're the architect of your destiny. You get to make your future up. Yes. Well said. And so as we wrap up, Mark, what are you excited about now that you're working on? Right now, I'm, I'm working on a couple of things. I'm, so I I'm, I'm created a new way of, of packaging all of my offerings to businesses that makes it more streamlined, more focused, um, and much more of a small step journey that is makes it easier for them to get the value and make a difference in their organizations. So I'm working on that. Uh, I've been delivering it and it's been going great. Um, I'm working on a new way of describing my business and who I am uh, to that makes it simpler to understand what I do. So I created a manifesto in the last two days that describes what I am about. So I'm very excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm very excited about developing some video content. Mm, fantastic. A lot of things to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> so how can our listeners learn more and connect with you, Mark? 
if they're interested in working with me on, on their leadership team or on their organization, please reach out to me at, it's very simple. You see my name at the top, bottom left of your screen. My email address is mark at kinnick.com. My web address is kinnick.com. And for anyone who's just listening and not on video, it's kinnick is in K-I-N-N-I-C-H. Yes. Perfect. And I'll also have uh, all, all that and the, any links that, are, uh, that you'd like to share, I'll have that in the show notes. So anyone listening who wants to reach out to Mark, look into what he's all about, you'll be able to do that. And so if you enjoyed our conversation today, I would love it if you would leave a review. Wherever it is that you're checking this out, it really helps. It means a lot. And subscribe to get updated as new episodes come out. Mark, is there anything you'd like to say before we close? Uh, just, Jamil, I really appreciate the opportunity. I've met you in Hawaii, and that now we're continuing it virtually uh, from New York to Chicago. Uh, I'm Chicago, Jamil's New York. <laughs> so thank you for, for that opportunity. And yeah. I'm sure we'll continue to be in touch in the future. Absolutely, Mark. Absolutely. And so as many of the listeners know, you know, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers create an extraordinary life without regret. And if I can be of service to you, I'd love to have a conversation, see if or how I can help. Please reach out, is at jamilsayage.com. And I'll also have that link in the show notes. And if you're looking for content to follow, you want more updates on the podcast, other content I put out, you can follow me at Instagram at Dr. Jamil Sayage, it's Dr. Jamil Sayage, or Facebook at Jamil Sayage. And so thank you all again for tuning in. Thank you, Mark, for taking the time to be with us today. And you know, in closing, what I have found is that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. For you, transformation can start today. So think about what we've discussed today. What will you do as a result of this conversation, as a result of what you've heard, of what you've learned? What will your future self thank you for? Really get clear on that. Take action. Go do it. And create a meaningful day. Take care. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.